Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's podcast, I'll be talking about the outlook for oil equities and what, if anything, we can learn from the experience of the 1970s. Now, I'm not going to be talking about any stocks, so I won't do a full disclaimer. But as always, do your own research. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Okay, this is the chart of the oil price over the last couple of years, and it has had a very good run. And oil equities have had a similarly good run. And regular viewers will know that I and I think a lot of our audience have been very long oil and gas companies over the past year. But we are expecting the world economy to slow and go into recession over the next 18 months. Although the Russian invasion of Ukraine means that the oil market is likely to remain tight. And therefore, even if the world economy goes into recession, it's likely that oil prices will remain high. So the question is, can oil equities continue to rise when the world economy is going into recession and equity markets in general, therefore, are falling if the oil price remains high and their profits remain high? Now, the last time this happened, where oil prices remained high, but there was a recession and a bear market in equities was in the 1970s. So hopefully, if we look at what happened to oil equities in the 1970s, we have an idea about what may happen this time. Okay, so we previously covered this on the weekly, but I'm going to recap. This is the oil price over the course of the 1950s to 70s and its inflation adjusted. So during that period, oil prices were not traded on markets generally. They were supplied through long-term fixed contracts. Therefore, oil prices tended to remain steady in nominal terms and were actually falling in real terms. That is, until the Yom Kippur War, when Nixon announced that he was going to send military aid to Israel, and the Arab nations then announced an oil embargo on the US and the West, sending the oil price soaring. So these are nominal oil prices, and you can see they leapt in 1973-74. So it was October 1973 was the Arab oil embargo. So these are inflation adjusted oil prices. And you'll see that they more than doubled between 1973 and 1974. One effect of that was to send the world economy into recession and equity markets into a tailspin. So this is the S&P 500, which had a terrible decade. But the years 1973-74 were particularly bad. So we've just seen that oil prices held up well during 1974 and rose throughout the decade. So what happened to the, the share prices of the big oil majors? Well, They weren't great. This is the share price of ExxonMobil, and its share price fell from a peak of above $3 to below $2 over the course of 1973-74. So that is a fall of over a third. Chevron share price peaked at over $5.5 a share and fell to almost $2.5. So it it halved over the same period. BP, bear in mind, BP was then 
very much focused on the Middle East and the Far East and had far fewer US assets than it does now, its share price absolutely collapsed from $4 in 1973 to below $1.50. These are the US prices. So terrible performance. So what happened to the profits of oil companies over that period? And this is a table from a congressional investigation into the profits of the oil companies in 1975, looking back over the previous periods, and you'll see that their profitability held up very well. So in 1974, Exxon had a rate of return of 21.3%, which was up on 1973 and well up on 1970. And if you break that down into its foreign assets and its US assets, it had a return of 22% in the US and 20.9% overseas. Although, see that in Q1 1975, the rate of return on its assets, both overseas and in the US, dropped precipitately. And the same pattern is repeated for the other majors. So these are the rates of return on shareholders' funds. So again, showing that returns held up very well in 1974. So the pattern is that profitability of the majors was very good in 1974, but their share prices fell very sharply. Now, why? Okay, so this is US inflation that was very strong over the period. And what's interesting is although the US economy went into a session, the US raised interest rates, which is obviously the opposite of what you expect the Fed to do now. So this is the Fed funds rate, which hit an amazing 13% during the recession of 1974 because of the rise in inflation. So these are our conclusions from the previous weekly segment on the performance of US oil companies during the 1970s. We, and we concluded that the fall can be partly explained by the rise in interest rates during the period. But in general, it appears that oil company shares were not immune to the general sell-off in the market. And therefore, if there's a general bear market and a recession coming forward, it would be sensible to cut your positions. But, one of our Discord members, Uncool Tom, sent me this. This is a link to a paper about the policy responses by the US government to the oil crisis of the 1970s. And it claims that the fall in oil company share prices was due to price controls and fears that the US government would phase out depletion deduction, i.e. hitting um, oil company profitability, and the risk of windfall taxes, again, hitting oil company profitability. So political responses to the oil crisis can be split into supply side and demand side legislation. And first of all, looking at supply side legislation, in November 1973, the Nixon administration passed the Emergency Petroleum Allocation Act. And bear in mind that the Arab oil embargo started in October of that year. So this was passed very quickly. And it regulated the price at which oil could be sold. So oil from old oil fields, i.e. pre-1973 oil fields, 
then the price of that production was capped at a low level at $5.35 a barrel. Whereas oil from newer fields, the price was capped at $11 a barrel, which was very close to the then market price of $12 a barrel, thereby providing an incentive for oil companies to invest in new production. Now, you should be aware that our charts have the oil price at $10 in 1974, not at $12 as this paper states, but um, I have no idea why there is that discrepancy. Okay, then in December 1975, the Ford administration passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. Now the background is that Ford wanted to repeal the Nixon legislation, but couldn't get the votes to do that. The political will wasn't there. And therefore, he passed an act which was less restrictive than the Nixon um, legislation. And it reduced price controls for domestic oil, removed a $2 tariff on oil imports, but created a maximum average price for domestic oil production. The net effect was it actually reduced US oil prices from $8.75 barrel to $7.66, and it would then allow the price of oil to rise by 10% per annum during the 40-month life of the Act. Now, the Act was repealed at the first opportunity after its 40-month life by the Carter administration. Now, demand-side legislation. So, in November 1973, Nixon, as part of the EPAA, instigated odd even rationing. So, vehicles with license plates ending in odd numbers could only refuel on days ending in odd numbers, and, and cars with number plates ending with even numbers could only refuel on days ending in even numbers. But obviously, you don't have to refuel your car every day. So it's unclear if this had any effect at all on demand. Then in January 1974, the Nixon administration passed the Highway Energy Conservation Act, which ordered states to reduce speed limits or lose access to federal highway funds. But... Nixon intentionally did not instigate taxes on gasoline. So surveys of US consumers showed that they would prefer to have rationing and price controls than higher prices at the pump. And therefore, Nixon's policy was price controls rather than higher taxes. And in 1975, the Ford administration instigated minimum fuel economy levels for new cars. And that continues to this day. So this is US oil production during the 1970s and 80s. And you see that the effect of price controls was to disincentivize domestic production, which fell during the oil crisis, then recovered when the legislation was repealed. So it was alleged that the cause of the fall in share price for the US oil majors during 1974 was political risks, price controls, the danger of a windfall tax, and the threat of the removal of depletion deduction allowances. Taking those one by one, price controls. Well, the US did instigate price controls starting in November 1973. But as we saw from the earlier table, oil company profits held up very well in 1974. They grew. So I don't think you can really say that price controls were a great threat to the oil companies. And in addition, all the US majors had big overseas earnings, which were exempt from US price controls. On the threat of a windfall tax, well, that was ruled out very early by the Nixon administration. 
surveys of consumers showed that they cared about the price at the pump. So Nixon instigated price controls to keep the price at the pump down rather than instigate windfall taxes and then have to redistribute the gains from the windfall tax. So the windfall tax was ruled out very early. There really wasn't much of a threat of a windfall tax in 1974. On the threat of the removal of depletion deduction allowances, which would have reduced the profitability of the oil majors, well, that is not mentioned at all in this paper. That, that is not to say it wasn't a threat, but the author of that tweet cited this paper as a reference for the threat of depletion deduction allowances and it's not there at all. So my revised conclusion is that I'm not convinced that the fall in oil company share prices during 1974 was caused by political risks. You'll see from the price charts that BP shares also fell sharply in 1974. In fact, BP shares were the worst performers and they had little US production at that time and so were unaffected by the um, US price controls. And also, as we saw, price controls did not reduce oil company profits. And on the threat of a windfall tax, well, that really wasn't much of a threat. And there's no citation for the claim that the fall in um, share prices was due to the threat of removal of depletion allowances. But above all, those political risks just don't appear sufficient to explain a big drop in oil prices when the um, oil majors were making very good profits, record profits. So bottom line is, frankly, I don't find any of the explanations for the fall in share price of the oil majors terribly convincing. Interest rate rises may well have had an effect. The political risks, well, political risks could be seen in the form of price controls, but the market would quickly have discounted the effect of those price controls once the legislation was passed in November 1973. And as you saw earlier, the tables show that oil company profitability held up very well in 1974. On balance, I think the best explanation for the fall in share prices during 1974 was simply that oil companies were not immune from the general sell-off in the market. And I return to the old market saw, in a crash, all correlations go to one. So if we do have a recession in the next 18 months and an extended bear market, that would mean that the risks are to the downside. Ec oil equities will struggle to rise and are likely to fall. So on that cheery note, please can you press like and subscribe to the channel and it is goodbye from me, Keith Jordan, goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. 
Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.